Why don't you shut up? Oh, my God! And let's get down to some real business. Awesome. The Out of Bounds Show with Paul Bounds. If it's a hot story, we're digging deep. It's the hottest. And it's on your home for nonstop sports. The Zone 105.9 and online at the Zone. It's hot. 1059.com. And good morning. Welcome in. Out of Bounds, 105.9 The Zone. Ole Miss will host the Arkansas Razorbacks at Swayze this weekend. And Mississippi State will be on the road. Auburn, Alabama, and uh, War Eagle Nation, or War Damn Eagle. WDE, as they like to uh, hashtag. So those are big. Every series is big. And in this state, it's uh, magnified. I can't believe it. We're at a place now where being good is ho-hum, and uh, it's all about which team is special. Uh, I don't think we know yet, but um, they're both going through some adversity. That happens. How do you handle it? You know, kind of some next man up a little bit. Who, uh, Who are some guys that may not have played as much? but that have been working really hard the last 8 to 12 weeks in practice, getting reps. Could they, you know, could another player or two emerge at some point on the roster to help you get to where you want to go by about, you know, May 15th or May 20th? Four weeks from now, five weeks from now, you know, we should know. Um, Well, you never know. I mean, who knows? But uh, UCLA, for example – was good, but then kind of bit the dust at the end of the season in basketball and then ripped off a bunch of wins um, in the NCAA tournament. So you don't ever know when it will quote-unquote click, but uh, Ole Miss is keeping an eye on Tim Elko, uh, SEC RBI leader. He is an absolute – he's a ribby machine, and he can change the game with the swing. Uh, On the flip side, Mississippi State doesn't have an alpha hitter. And they're a pop-up machine right now. I really think, look, Josh Hatcher is not Mangum, Foskey, Westberg. And and Mangum's different than those other two as far as I know they're better MLB prospects. But, you know, Mangum's one of the greatest college baseball players of all time. But I think you understand where I'm going as far as production. Believe it or not, you need Josh Hatcher to get – he doesn't have to be 400 down the stretch. But if he could hit 280 to 300 down the stretch and start gap hitting and kind of convince some of the other guys to hit the ball in the gap, then that would be something that you need. It's obvious they're just it's, they're trying to jack the ball out of the park, and that's not – it's not working. I mean, it was lazy fly ball to lazy fly ball to Southern University last night. I was there in the outfield in between bites of uh, – ribeye poppers from welcome home beef and um you know just la- lazy fly balls i know i know southern uh dropped a couple but yippee that's you know that's a team that you should beat um they're not hitting the ball i mean and you don't you don't have an alpha hitter right now i mean you just don't have one that's on now rowdy may be heating up slowly here he is you know he starts slow this may have been a little extended um he did hit a shot last night um I don't know. Ole Miss has some other bats, you know. Uh, you know, I, I keep going back to 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 Brad Pitt slash Billy Bean and Moneyball, and how they were going to build uh, three different players to match Giambi's own base percentage. You know, it's all about getting to first base. It really doesn't matter how you do it. Um, and I love the quote in the in in both the book and and the movie. Fielding doesn't matter. Uh, especially when they were talking about first base. Um, But, you know, outside of Skinner, who kind of brings a little juice to that lineup, and you've had some other guys kind of go in and out, I don't see a lot there. So um, I really think Hatcher just needs to get – this is easier said than done. Hitting a baseball like hitting a golf ball is extremely difficult. Or doing it well. How about that? Hitting a lazy pop-up as a Southeastern Conference hitter. Yeah. But, um, you know, the Hatcher to me is the one guy with some edge to him. 
but he doesn't I'm not saying he doesn't have any credibility, but when you're in this kind of slump, you can't be the guy that tells the clubhouse what to do. So he needs to rip like two doubles and get going for Mississippi State. We'll see what Ole Miss does as far as Elko. You know, does do, do Bianco does Bianco and the staff get together and start? How do we build a way to to match this kind of production? I mean, it's kind of what the Oakland A's did when they, um, you know, when they lost Giambi and Damon and uh, the other dude. And so they they just basically they just added their own base percentage together and said, how do we get there? Um, we'll see. Mississippi State's not getting on base enough. That's that's for sure. So their pitching is excellent, but man, to put that much pressure on your staff every outing, and especially as you get deeper into the season and then you get into postseason, I don't know. Um, Blake Mania is with me. I'm your host, Bo Bounce. The show is brought to you by the Ribeye Medium Rare Barbecue Shrimp Appetizer. And Four Roses Bourbon Single Barrel Manhattan, Kessler Prime in the Renaissance. Visit KesslerPrime.com to make a reservation. Also, the homemade hot tamales at Kessler Prime. Farm Bureau Insurance call in line, 601-707-3750. Twitter handle at Bo Bounds. And uh, we'll have Chris Lamonis on at 915. And... Then we'll have John Ledyard, PewterReport.com, Tampa Bay Bucks, Buccaneers insider. But he's heavy into the NFL draft. Ledyard is, loves it, lives it, breathes it. So we'll get all up in the quarterbacks from Trevor Lawrence to Mac Jones to Justin Fields to Zach Wilson to uh, Trey Lance and uh, who am I missing? Kyle Trask and Kellen Mond and there's a couple others that are all kind of, you know, here we are. Um, are the Jets going to go with Zach Wilson, who weighs 200 pounds? I'm not saying he can't be good, but man, oh man, when you have a slight build, that just eesh. it. Now Lamar Jackson's been able to pull this thing off. I'm convinced he's made of like titanium steel or something. It's incredible. Um, you want to be built like Dak, Eli, Peyton, Brady, Russell. Um, some of those guys. I will say Montana was kind of uh, – think about it. He wasn't a big dude. Probably about 6'2". But he may have weighed a little bit more than I think. Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, he was a good player at BYU without a doubt, but I would think he's got to gain a minimum of 15 pounds quickly. Uh, Blake, how are you, is, man? Isn't isn't the hottest name in the NFL draft Mac Jones? Because he could go third, we think, or he could go fifth in the QB rankings. I think so. Surely the Sanford – I mean, I think this is a smoke screen. Agreed. I may be wrong. I think this is a total smoke screen from the San Francisco 49ers and John Lynch, Hall of Famer, safety, and Kyle Shanahan, the super bright, young offensive mind, that is their head coach, Blake. I agree. I think it's – because if you look at everything they did prior to this draft season when they have this pick now, which they didn't have heading into the season, everything he's ever said about quarterback play would tell you he would never pick Mac Jones or substitute name of whoever you want that fits the same build, style, and play. Right. Right? Like it doesn't – it's not because it's Mac Jones and because it's Alabama. It's because of who that quarterback is. He's always talked about quarterbacks that are built like – Josh Allen built yes. like built like Trey Lance or Justin Fields or Zach Wilson those guys and and honestly I don't know enough about it I'm not I'm not a, so I don't know who to Trey Lance Justin Fields it's a great point Blake I mean who is it is it just a flip of the coin I mean Fields played for the huge brand blue blood of Ohio State so most of you know who he is Trey Lance didn't even play football last year yeah, he played one game. And, and when he wasn't playing, nobody's watching North Dakota State unless you're a uh, degenerate gambler, which is okay. Welcome in. Good morning. Out of Bounds, ESPN 105.9 The Zone is brought to you by Mississippi Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center. MississippiSportsMedicine.com. MississippiSportsMedicine.com. Back in a minute.
Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was in the uh, left field lounge last night, and uh, some guys were kind enough to fire up the grill with some uh, ribeye poppers, bacon wrapped ribeye poppers from Welcome Home Beef. Welcome Home Beef has their uh, retail shop here in Starkville. Um, and they were delicious. And there could have been some Miller Lite and Coors Light flowing too. It's National Beer Day. Want to celebrate that with a cold Modelo on the back patio or porch later today. National Beer Day. And it's it's a Wings Wednesday. I mean, presented by Modelo. And Two Brothers Smoked Meats. Talking about smashing some wings at Two Brothers. May have to do that for... Uh, for lunch, National Beer Day, Blake. So we're giving away a 12-pack of Modelo, mm. and we'll throw in um, an Out of Bounds T-shirt. We've got some real cool quality vintage tees. Um, so we'll throw in a T-shirt and a 12-pack of Modelo. Must be 21 or older. Best text today on beer, on food, or on sports. It's probably the importance in that order. <laughs> uh, we'll win the 12 pack of Modelo and an out of bounds shirt. You can pick it up. If you win, you'll pick it up at the y'all lifestyle shop in the township in Ridgeland by nukes. Blake mania with me. I'm your host, Bo bounds. We'll have Chris Limonis in an hour. Chris Limonis head baseball coach at MSU in an hour. And, um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about where his team is and, uh, maybe where they are. Well, I know they're headed to Auburn, but, um, where they're headed as far as growth, that's what everybody's looking for with Ole Miss and MSU. It is insane. These teams are winning like crazy. They are ranked extraordinarily high. I mean, national rankings. They have really, 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 really good players. And yet the question, and you know it is, it's there. It's lingering. It's like the big, 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 big shadow in the room. The big bear in the room. Or do you have a special team? Because a special team can win their way through the postseason. All y'all are thinking is Omaha, the promised land, and the College World Series. Can you get to the CWS in June? Is your team good enough to fight their way through a regional and a super regional and get on a plane and fly to the sweet place of Omaha, Nebraska? That's it. That's where we are in this state. And uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, I've been following this for a long time. But that that Ole Miss has now become a really good baseball program. That Mississippi State finally, I never would have thought that MSU would have, well, I guess I never thought that Ole Miss would would become a, a really, really good program just because until 2002, you know, I lived here. I started following baseball in 1980 at seven years old. I grew up in the outfield at Duty Noble. I, it was just MSU and Southern Miss and Delta. I mean, it was Boo. The deal was Ron Polk and Boo Ferris and Southern Miss. And we had some other things going on. I mean, Braddy at Jackson State did an amazing job with no budget. But you know where I'm going. Um. And so Ole Miss has become a really, really good baseball program. And then I never thought that I would see Mississippi State bottom out. Absolute and totally bottom out. And have to be rebuilt. Yeah, If if you would have told me that in 2000, well, when I was a kid in 85 going to Smith Wills and Duty Noble, I would have said you're crazy because it was Raffy Clark, Brantley, Thigpen, and so on. But uh, if you would have told me while I was doing this show that they would bottom out to literally 14th in the league, I'm sorry, 12th, it's pre-A&M Missouri, and, and have to be rebuilt and modernized by an alum in John Cohen, I'd have said, Blake, I would have leveraged everything. Yeah. I'd have said, you're you are crazy. I will win that bet. It's what Bama fans. It's what Bama fans would say about football right now. That's a great point. A it's a great point. No chance it'll ever get down to the the bottom level again. No chance. And and so John Cohen 
kicking and screaming, modernized MSU baseball. And now here we are with two teams that are in the top ten and that are definitely top 15 programs. And it's all about being special and going. I mean, it is literally, this is where we are today. Omaha or bust. What weighs heavier? We, are, we have all lost our mind, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> what what weighs heavier on the team or the program or the coach or whatever, however you want to put it? Bianco's kind of impending, or not, like the bubbling up of like, oh, he's got to make Omaha. Every time he doesn't make Omaha, it's even more exacerbated that he's only made it once. Is that shadow bigger, or is it the Mangum, like, lack of identity in the locker room shadow for Mississippi State? Which one Which one do you think is more imposing, and which one do you think can be overcome this season? Okay. Uh, the Mangum shadow is the one that I think currently, Blake, like right now, right, at 821 in the morning in this for this moment. club, yeah. is, is the biggest deal. Because he's the biggest game changer in the program since Raffi and Will. In a different way, but in 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 what they did too. Uh, just a different time and, and so on. And so I think they are trying to find their way out of the wilderness, so to speak. And you can't you can't fabricate. I mean you can't just go grab leadership, Blake. Every company is chasing leadership and culture and all that stuff. So it just can't – somebody can walk in the locker room and go, come on, guys. Well, that that doesn't do it. Or let's go today. I mean, let's get after their – boom. That still doesn't do it. Jake had the ability to set the tone in the locker room and on the field. I'm telling you, even though Josh Hatcher – look – for Mississippi State standards, he's not close to a special player. Is he better than me and 99% of our audience listening? Absolutely. He needs to get his bat going because he's the one guy with the edge that if he can go 5 for 15 or 5 for 12 or 13 and a couple of doubles and some big hits, he can start walking in the locker room and saying a few things. They're trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark every at bat when they they need to be a gap-hitting team. And I don't know a lot about baseball. But one lazy pop fly after another, and I can figure this thing out. Now, on the mound, they're fantastic. Ole Miss now faces some adversity today. They went through some with Nikhazy, got him back. He's pitching lights out. Tim Elko is an absolute monster, one of the best players in the country. He can hit a three-run bomb, boom, change the game, baby. You're down 4-3, you're up 6-4. That's a special player at the collegiate level. He has torn his ACL. He may try to give it a go. What does that look like as a DH? I don't know. They'll, uh, he's I mean, he's obviously a phenomenal athlete, and strong, knee brace. We'll see how Kurt, that looks. Kurt Gibson this thing? Hit a, hit a, Gibson. Hit a walk-off that, home run uh, in Oxford for the Super Regional to send him to Omaha with one leg. He'll hobble around the bases. Oh, my gosh. You're <laughs> talking about absolute and total pandemonium. <laughs> There'd be no more beer to throw in Oxford. If you thought Jake Mangum getting a hit and then Elijah McNamee hitting a bomb to secure the win over Stanford two years ago in the Super Regional – to send Mississippi State to Omaha was big. If Tim Elko were to do something like that in a super regional with a knee brace, (laughs) it would be lights out. They would not have enough beer in Oxford that night to handle that celebration. Good morning. Welcome in. Out of Bounds, 105.9 The Zone. Chris Lamonis will join us at 9.15. It's National Beer Day brought to you by Modelo. Enjoy an ice-cold Modelo with the lime later this afternoon on the back porch or patio or your favorite local restaurant. Also, we'll be live from Roosevelt's and Live Oaks Golf Club tomorrow. Bloody Mary Bar, join us for lunch. Live Oaks. Good morning. Welcome in. 
The Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone, Ole Miss, Mississippi State Baseball. We'll see. It's all about Omaha. Crazy. Expectations are insane. I mean, I like them, but uh, it's very ho-hum as we march to uh, the postseason. I mean, the two fan bases have decided this is what we want. We want to be national seeds. We want to host host. And we want to fly to Omaha, Nebraska and play in TD Ameritrade at the College World Series. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's too many things, I, uh, variables and games to be played. Is Ole Miss special? I don't know. Is Mississippi State? I don't know. Um, do I see some special pieces, parts of the roster? Sure. But uh, baseball's a weird, funky game, and um, we'll see. Uh, it's going to get hot, and it's going to get serious, and, you know, you got to keep winning, position yourself to host, and that's going to be a little bit different, the early part of that. Um, and then we'll go from there. And do you have enough in the clubhouse? You know, the bottom line. Uh, we see it in football all the time. I mean, you, you, we have watched teams that have no leadership. Doesn't mean they don't have good athletes. They just really don't have a purpose. We we see that with our football teams, Labor Day through. And then you, you've had some teams in Starkville and Oxford that you can tell, man, the locker room is right. And um, it's boring, and it, it's what we, uh, when our parents would tell us the three to four things that they always said to us, and we rolled our eyes or shook our head, but it really does matter, and they're very, very simple. It, it's what it is here. And uh, I don't know yet. It's still a work in progress. Uh, I do have some questions, but I also like a lot of what I see from the Rebs and Dogs. So no team is going to be perfect. I mean, look, Florida – Florida has struggled. LSU's in the dumps. Now, Bandy's nasty. Um, But everybody, I think, is going to get hit in the nose at some point over a 56-game schedule, and then you you don't cruise, then you grind into Hoover. And I think that's where you kind of start to set up your team for the – well, you do that before, but really set up your team for the tournament, the real tournament. That would be the regionals. And here we go. So, uh, boy, that debate's always out there, isn't it? How much do you really want to win in Hoover? Yeah, we want to win a game or two, but then we're cool with going back home and getting in our bed and rehabbing, resting a little bit, and getting ready for the for the regional. So, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Uh, can I? Uh, and and sad. I mean, the Tim Elko stuff's tough. Uh, he still may have a big moment or two or three on the way out. Uh, he may or may not. I don't know. I don't put anything past athletes this day and age. Um, our sports injuries are always uh, presented by Mississippi Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center. Uh, I know that Tim Elko has outstanding people around him, and he's the All-American uh, RBI leader for Ole Miss with a torn ACL. Flip side, Mississippi State, they're not hitting the ball. They, they do not have a dude in the lineup that just you look at it and go, that – that guy scares me. Um, but their pitching is magnificent, so we'll see. Blake? I was going to ask, you mentioned that LSU's in the dumps, and barring a miraculous comeback, even if they do okay down the stretch, they're not going to be anything close to what they wanted to be, and they're all American starter Jaden Hill now out for the year with Tommy John. So let's say the season continues in that trajectory, and they have a bad year in baseball. What are the waters going to be like come September for Ed Orgeron and that LSU football team? <laughs> if if LSU fans are coming off like a you know generationally poor baseball season with a football team that's in hot water in the in the NCAA market and is like you said bringing two new coordinators and coming off a really poor year themselves, you know, you make a good point there that. Um when you don't play well in one sport that you like a lot and that the fan base is into, and then the next one comes up, there is a little bit more pressure, although there's already a lot for, for anybody at LSU in, in football. 
Yeah, look, Ogeron, they're going to have to get it up. This is going to be one of the biggest question marks in the SEC. And that is LSU has top five talent. Ed Ogeron is going on his third set of coordinators. He has to travel to Startville and to Oxford. I expect those teams to be a lot better. Mississippi State already beat you last year. Leach already has a top a win over a top five recruiter. Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss turned the ball over like six or seven times and led in the second half and had a chance to win. They came up a little short. So what it, that doesn't bode well going to Startville and Oxford for LSU. And that those are two teams that LSU does not believe by any stretch that they should lose to. They chalk that up as a win in one second when they're going through the schedule. And so that doesn't count Alabama. That doesn't count playing Dan Mullen in Florida. That doesn't count Auburn. And that doesn't count LSU. I'm sorry, A&M, which are all teams that recruit well and have dudes. So you can't go 8-4, and four, much less 7-5. and five. Now you go out to UCLA, Chip Kelly is not – recruited well, but I think one thing to keep an eye on with that game with LSU and UCLA is UCLA is returning a really good quarterback. Now, does UCLA have the dudes in the line of scrimmage? No. If 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 LSU has – I'm sorry, does UCLA – did I say that right? Does UCLA have the dudes in the line of scrimmage? Absolutely not to, to handle LSU. Now, does UCLA have DBs that can cover LSU? No. So if LSU can get up and running at all on offense, they should be able to score at will even if UCLA gives them problems through UCLA's quarterback and Chip Kelly, who even though Chip is kind of off the grid, he's still special. You don't win that long at New Hampshire and do what he did at Oregon and and what he accomplished at Philadelphia the first two years. And, and you know, you are an elite offensive dude. Just because you don't get into recruiting, but um, and, and I think he's hired a a pretty average staff, but that could be the the deal that makes that interesting. So to answer your question, Blake, um, O is going to be under a lot of pressure. I don't know if they fire him as long as off the field doesn't go against him. Anything off the field, even if he goes. Um, Eight and four, much less seven and five, which is really hard to do at LSU. I mean, that's hard to do, to go to go seven and five. But if he does, he will be either let go, which I don't think so, but um, or he will be on the super duper hot seat um, th- in twenty twenty two. According to the Advocate, uh, and this was written in December of this past year, so twenty twenty. Uh, Ed Orgeron's buyout is written as 70% of remaining contracts. So if he were to be fired coming up, it would be $27 million. Then the following year, $21 million, 16, 12, 8, 4, gotcha. so on and so forth. Yeah. Terrible con- another terrible contract of what you didn't have to do even who, after he won a national title. Who is stealing Ed Orgeron from you? Where's uh, nobody. Where's he going to go? Nobody. No, nobody. Not, it's not happening. And, that, and and some people are confused at that because he's a national championship coach. But Well, I mean, let me ask you this. Who's knocking down Gene Chizik's door? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Will Muschamp got a, what, $15 million buyout clause in, at South Carolina? Where, where He was fired from Florida. Where was he going to go when he was at South Carolina? Right. Where was he going to go? Ray Tanner it was a really good baseball coach. AD, uh, I mean, he just hired Shane Beamer. I don't know what to do with that. That's hard to do. I mean, they're a $125, $30 million athletic department, and they landed on Shane Beamer. I like Shane. But you're South Carolina. You couldn't go get a guy who is, you know, established at the G5 or Power 5 level that that has won a bunch of games as – um, a head coach or a dynamite OC, you know, being running backs coach and special teams coordinator or whatever, tight ends coach and spe- – uh, I don't know. I don't know. 
That's uh that was a great hire for Dan Mullen and Kirby Smart. I mean, you know, they were over there going, Love it. Thank you. Ray Tanner, you get a suite at Georgia and a suite at Florida. I mean, thanks for not allowing South Carolina to get in our way at all of going of fighting duking duking it out to go to Atlanta, so to speak. And even, you know, I think Kentucky and Missouri are sitting there going, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ray Tanner, for for hiring Shane Beamer. And Shane may be great. But on paper, it says no. Uh, you had a stat a few months ago, Blake, that talked about all the oh my gosh, yeah. coaches, I think, without head coaching experience Correct. Or They're under 500 in okay. SEC play. Tuberville? Oh, well, even Dan wasn't fi- over five. No, overall, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not in – like, overall, they're under 500. But I'm, I'm sorry. I meant, like, first-year co- first year head coaches who their first job is in the SEC are under 500. Right. That's why Tommy Tuberville – and Dan Mullen are so special. But you knew they were early. You knew. I mean, it, it, you watched Tuberville's team in 95 coming out of probation, and you knew. You watched Dan's team in 09 when he almost beat LSU, and you knew. I mean, you knew early that that those two were probably going to get it done, that things looked really good. Um, with with Joe Moorhead, you knew early. I mean, he made Kentucky look like Alabama, and then he made a Florida team that was in total transition look good. So you knew early. Here's those stats on the uh, first time. Ed, so this is from 2000. So si- this is according to Brad Crawford with 247 Sports. Since 2000, there have been 17 coaches hired as first time head coaches. Ten of them have been fired, two left for a better job, and uh, now, actually, let me rephrase that, 12 have been fired, because this was written right before Pruitt and Mason were fired. So okay. 12 now of the 17 have been fired, two left for a better job. Um, those coaches, all 17 of them, combined 371 and 399. Huh. All okay. 12 were fired, bef- uh, oh, excuse me, 11 of the 12, other than Mason, were fired before the end of the fifth season. Yeah, Vandy kept Mason way too long. Um, don't forget, Derek Mason's at Auburn. I think that's something that we need to keep an eye on. He is considered an A defensive coordinator play caller. And Auburn always has defensive players. Um, I mean, they've been known as ground and pound. They're kind of running back you and play defense. I mean, a lot like Bama, light. Uh, now, Bama has totally, totally rebooted their deal on offense. Pretty much my whole life, all Bama's done is either run the wishbone or the power or some kind of running game. And um, boom, Nick Saban flips that thing. Amazing. Auburn, they're still more, you know, 1971. Shug Jordan, Pat Dye. Uh, that type stuff. Um, great defensive players, very, very physical. Derek Mason's the D.C. down there, and he is unreal. And he's never coached this caliber of athlete. Stanford had good athletes, but Auburn recruits at a super high level, Atlanta, Florida, Alabama, Panhandle. Well, they come over here and take some of our players. Um so he, he's never worked with this type of talent. Now, they recruited, like, for them, not well. Everything kind of unraveled with Gus Malzahn and Limbo and Harson and so on. Um, but you would think they still have enough enough on, on the yeah. roster to, uh, you know, give some people some fits. That is – can you imagine if he if if Mason shuts down a couple of people this year? He's going to. In in like big, I'm talking about like what if he messes with LSU? Like we we were just talking about Ed, Ed Ozeron, Blake. What if he messes with LSU one Saturday to the point where you're like, oh my God, Derek Mason is just. I mean he he spent all week and he is owning them. 
Uh, that's the problem that Ogeron and LSU could run into, even though they have more talent than um, – than Auburn. Well, and what do we see with first-time play callers at That's almost any level? What if he does level? that to A&M? Oh, he like, absolutely uh, could. Breaking in a new QB? Yeah, absolutely could. What if he what, – because, you know, I don't know what they're going to be on offense, so what if they have to win 17-10, to 20-13 in year one as Harson and the other side of the ball get up and running? Sorry, what were you saying about first-year – No, I was going to say first-year play callers at any, at any level get befuddled mid-game by veteran defensive play callers. We see that. All the time. So Derek Mason has more than one trick up his sleeve as a guy who's coached both at the D.C. level and the head coach level in the SEC for a long time. That guy knows how to coach. He does. Let me segue to Zach Arnett. Zach Arnett did what he did as the program was burning down. It's very true. With no play calling experience at that level. None. And he had no special player. There was no Jeffrey Simmons, Fletcher Cox, Chris Jones, Willie Gay. All phenomenal players. A-plus skill dudes. I'm not saying that Brule and Martin Emerson and some of these guys are not good. Um, but there is a difference between a difference maker and good players in this league. And yet, Zach Arnett had the ability to literally shut people down for big chunks in the game, the way the game is played now, which favors the offense. And it's not it's not the cool piece to talk about because we want to talk about Kiffin and his modern day Baylor offense, which has got air raid tendencies, and then we want to talk about Leach and the air raid. But Arnett did this with with no special player. No doubt. And he lost six safeties. What do you think about that? I, so what he did throughout the season to even give them a chance to win, I mean, they, sh- they had every opportunity to beat Arkansas and Kentucky because of Zach Arnett. They had every opportunity to beat Georgia because of Zach Arnett. And they hung in there against Ole Miss. I mean, Lane wanted to go for Leach's jugular. Uh, I think the boosters had been in his ear. Blowout, blow, embarrassing, you know, win 51 to 20. But he kept going for it inside the 10, and Arnett was able to, to do enough for Mississippi State to hang in that ball game. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. Yeah, he was. Outside of Kiffin in the offense – Zach Arnett was off the ch- – A-plus in his first year. And if we want to say Corral and Kiffin in that group had an A, A-plus year, Zach Arnett in that group had an A, A-plus year. Oh, well, look at him against Tulsa. Yeah. Mississippi State got bogged down again in the bowl game. Mm-hmm. Now, Tulsa, G5-wise, you saw their numbers. They were really good. I don't know where they got those players on the defensive side of the football, but Zach Arnett won that game. What, they have three picks, four picks? Um, He's a guy that we're not going to talk a lot about because of the corral shadow and the fact that he could go to the NFL and offense is more exciting and, everybody, and nobody really wants to dive into defense. But, man, that guy for 34 years old did some amazing stuff when everything was falling apart within the program. So not, not to totally play into your stereotype, but uh can I ask you a really controversial question about Matt sure. Corral and Lane Kiffin? Sure. Uh because that is uh, people love it. So I was thinking about what you said uh recently about Corral and and what David Johnson said in the season they could have is Matt Corral the most talented quarterback Lane Kiffin's coached? I would well, So okay, so he had Tua slash Jalen, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't really coach Tua. Uh, he had Matt Barkley at Southern Cal. But he wasn't the OC. No, he was the head coach. Oh, Matt. I'm sorry. I'm thinking Matt Lineart. No, he had, Bar- he had Barkley yeah, yeah, yeah. as head coach. Yes. And Barkley, when, obviously. When I walked in, Blake, when I walked into Heritage Hall several years ago, uh, the first guy that I ran in at Southern Cal's campus, the first guy I ran into was Matt Barkley who took me up to Kiffin and Ogeron's office. Anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah, so that's my question. Is like, 
Is oh, well, I don't Matt think that's Corral. hyperbole. Is is Matt Corral legitimately the best quarterback Lane Kiffin will have ever coached? Yes. Uh, Matt Corral is more talented than Jalen Hurts, Tua, and Matt Barkley. Ooh, more talented than Tua. Be hot cake. You don't – I mean, I understand what Tua was coming in, Blake, and I understand that the walk-off will live, you know, in this space forever – because any time uh, – I can't ever remember another walk-off national championship in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, well, hold on. No, Vince Young ran it in with like – But it wasn't uh, the end of the game. Exactly. Um, over Southern Cal, wasn't there like 30 seconds yes. left? Yes, Southern Cal 20? ran like four offensive plays. The... Okay. All right, so, so a walk-off in the national title game by Tua is something that is impossible for a fan to shake. That moment. And it was a big stage, and he did it. And he, he hit Devontae Smith in stride. Great throw. Got to give the young man all the credit in the world. And he was poised in the second half and did some things that uh, Bama needed because they were on their heels the way that Georgia had played in the first half in that title game. But as far as talent, arm, mobility, the ability to keep your eyes down the field, move around in the pocket, and extend plays, Matt Corral is more talented than Jalen Hurts to it. And of course, it's not close with Matt Barkley. And I like him. He was really nice to us that day and didn't have to be, especially when you're the big man on campus at Southern Cal and the quarterback. But, uh, yes, Matt Corral is the most talented QB that Lane Kiffin has coached. Ooh. That's, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I there's a reason I asked it, but like you talked about Alabama's offensive talent and everything, and I you could argue that Kiffin's offense is the direct correlation to why they have the receivers that they have now, you know, and and that those types of players want to play in that offense. So for Kiffin to have done what he did with the quarterbacks he's had, I just wonder, you know, what is the legitimate ceiling for Matt Corral this season? Mm-hmm. Let me switch gears, Blake. Let's go to the Mississippi Ag John Deere Tractor text line, 601-885-3776. Before I go to that real quick, we're going to be live tomorrow at Roosevelt's at Live Oaks. They're going to be serving breakfast at 7 a.m., and then we're going to be there all the way through lunch. Come join us for lunch tomorrow at Roosevelt's at Live Oaks. Get you a Philly cheese steak sandwich, a cheeseburger, or some wings. And we're going to have a big time as it's round one of the Masters at Augusta National. Tomorrow, live Roosevelt's at Live Oaks. Our Masters coverage is always brought to you by Edwin White's Golf Shop on County Line Road. Carrie and the crew will get your golf game, get you ready for the next, oh, seven or eight months as you hit the links. So our Masters coverage will be brought to you by... Edwin Watts Golf Shop on County Line Road. That's where you want to go before you go to Dancing Rabbit Golf Club or Live Oaks Golf Club. Blake's got some uh, Masters prop bets that we're going to discuss on the other side. And we'll continue to uh, talk a little Kiffin and Leach. Chris Limonis, 915 on the Modelo Guest Line.